if you were going to be baptized as an adult, as a free thinker, deciding for yourself what you want to believe, you were at odds with the state. The state could not afford it because there would be insurrection. Heavenly Father, once again, we do not want to do anything by ourselves. So please, Lord, for the sake of those people out there, once again, give us strength and wisdom to deal with these issues. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Babylon has fallen, part two. Now, part two deals with the issues at hand as they are unfolding in the world currently. And one of the issues that will have to take place in order for the legislation which is embodied in the book of Revelation to be enforced is that there must be power unto the beast. He must get his power back that he lost during the mortal wound. And we identified the beast as Roman Catholicism. Revelation 13, verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Now, why did they worship the dragon? It sounds so harsh to say that Roman Catholicism worships the dragon. It sounds so terrible. It sounds like hate speech. It does. And I was a Roman Catholic, and yes, I would be offended. And I can understand. But what was the dragon's religion? Do you remember? You will surely not die. Does Rome teach the immortality of the soul? Does it know that it's not biblical? Yes, because it says so in its own encyclopedia. The Bible does not teach that, but we teach it. And it's a Greek philosophy. Does Rome teach that you can distinguish between good and evil and that you don't need an extraneous source like the Bible in order to do that? Yes, Rome teaches that. Whose doctrine is that? It's the dragon's doctrine. And if you read some of their statements, it also claims that ye can be God. And it's affiliated organizations all over the world preach the same thing. So all three of the issues raised by the dragon in the book of Genesis are being taught as doctrine by this institution. And therefore, if you follow it, you are worshipping whom? The dragon, because you're believing the dragon rather than God. It's as simple as that. It's, it doesn't mean that the people within the system are even aware of it. They're not. I was a Roman Catholic. I wasn't aware of it. There are other Roman Catholics sitting in this audience that weren't aware of it. But once you become aware of it, well, then it's a fact. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So there's a second power which does these things. Pope warns against elitism, cruelty, and extreme individualism in the West. Pope Francis has slammed economically advanced countries for elitism and individualism while calling for compassion and tolerance for refugees, displaced people, and anybody who's different. It sounds so good. Today's world is increasingly becoming more elitist and cruel towards the excluded. Pope Francis wrote Monday in a message. The most economically advanced societies are witnessing a growing trend towards extreme individualism, which combined with utilitarian mentality and reinforced by the media is producing a globalization of indifference. 
Individualism is a problem to the papacy and has always been a problem to the papacy. It cannot tolerate individual thought. You have to be merged into society which they control or else you will become a problem to the system. And what was their solution in the past for those who dared to think for themselves? Yes, you were burnt at the stake. It's as simple as that. The principles of common good in the Catholic Church's social doctrine. We need to understand this. This is from the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. So the sources we are using are original sources. Everyone also has the right to enjoy the conditions of social life that are brought about by the quest for the common good. So you're allowed to enjoy the conditions of social life that are brought about by the common good. It's very important that we understand their way of writing. Because it always sounds so good, but there's a sting of death in it. The distribution of created goods, which as every discerning person knows, is laboring today under the gravest evils due to the huge disparity between the few exceedingly rich and the unnumbered property less, etc. Well, that is rerum novarum, the papal encyclical, that it is not stealing if you take from those that have and give to those that do not have. But the Bible calls it stealing. The Bible says it's stealing. But they say it's not, if it is for the common good. Tasks of the political community, the responsibility of attaining the common good besides falling to individual persons belongs also to the state. Since the common good is the reason that the political authority exists, we don't have to read it all, the individual person, the family, or intermediate groups are not able to achieve their full development by themselves, for living is a truly human life. Now we must understand that language. You must understand how they think. What does it mean to live a truly human life? We need to have it identified. Please explain yourself. What does it mean to live a truly human life? We'll get to that. Pope Francis, I want you to look at the dates, please. This is May 2, 2019. Pope Francis called on national, nations to work towards a global common good. Thursday, particularly in confronting climate change, human trafficking, and nuclear threats. In the current situation of globalization, not only of the economy, but also of the technological and cultural exchanges, the nation state is no longer able to procure the common good of its population alone. So we need a global coming together in order to enforce the common good. It has to be global. That means the whole world, how much of the world will be involved? All of it. The common good has become global and nations must associate for their own benefit. He's speaking with authority. The Pope warned against nationalism that raises walls. That's a reference to whom? Obviously, President Trump. But I don't want you to forget that this is a game called Hegelian dialectic. It's a game to channel the mindset of humanity into a direction of accepting the common good. And the only way you will do that is if the pain of accepting it exceeds not accepting it. So let's create so much chaos and so much pain that everybody will accept it. And how do you do that? By creating the extreme poles which create the chaos that you say, I cannot live with this anymore. I'm not even safe to go into a Walmart anymore. Please do something. And then you've been duped into giving up your freedom. 
Pope, let us not confuse the common good with prosperity. <laughs> I like that. That means I want the common good, but don't think you're going to get anything out of it. That's exactly what it means, in other words, isn't it? I want you to think like me, but you're not going to be any better off. I'm a cruel taskmaster. Look at the Middle Ages and you'll know why. So the common good, on the other hand, the Pope continued, is much more than the sum of the individual interests. I don't necessarily read every slide completely, but it's there so that if anybody looks at it later, they can pause it and they can read it for themselves. Because otherwise they say, I'm, I'm doing this out of context. Do you understand? The common good, on the other hand, the Pope continues, is much more than the sum of individual interests. It moves from what is best for me to what is best for everyone. So this is merging your individuality into society. You may not think above that which is the common good for the society. That's where your level of thinking must be. U.S. Catholic faith in real life, what is the common good? The task of creating a good life for all members of society is never perfectly realized. This comes from uscatholic.org. The common good is a lot like a set of optimal conditions that allow both the team and its player to succeed. In theological terms, the common good is defined in Pope John XXIII's encyclical Mater et Magistra on Christianity and social progress as the sum total of the social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Sounds good. Perhaps the greatest difficulty with this analogy, however, is being seeing a society as a team. Our society is so thoroughly individualistic that it's difficult to see beyond our own individual happiness. Solidarity encourages us to see one another as each other's keepers to make sure that no individual is hogging the ball. What does that say? To make sure that no individual is hogging the ball. Also necessary is the state, which acts like a coach to guarantee the coherency, unity, and organization of the civil society. Now, excuse me, the state doesn't consist of individuals much brighter than the average citizen. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious, it's just a fact, right? Yeah. Because they're drawn from common citizens, aren't they? Yeah. So who's the one who's going to tell the state what to do? Who's going to define for the state what the common good is? After all, isn't he arguing supposedly here against those that talk nationalism and build walls? So he's trying to tell that state, if you can guess which that one is, that this is not the way. You have to come this way. Now let's go to another sort. This is the Jesuit Social Research Institute. Catholic social thought and the common good. The critical Catholic thinking is the fundamental concept of the common good. The catechism following John the 23rd in Mata Magistra, this is the same story, it's just, I'm going to read the highlight. The common good applies to each human community. Your dogs are exempt. But its most complete realization occurs in the political community where the state's role is to defend and promote the common good of civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies. Total control. The state has to control everything so that you can have common good. Pastor, I want to know, what is common good? I'd like to know. The Catechism notes three essential elements of common good that bring about the social well-being. But what I really want to highlight is that the common good's conceptual roots lie in what? In Greek and Roman philosophy. As the goal of political life. As the goal of political life. The good of the city and the task entrusted to civic leaders. 
Greek and Roman. So we're talking about the body of the beast, which was the leopard. And the enforcing was the horns, which were what? Rome. Rome. And they're going to enforce it. They're going to enforce the common good. And this comes from the Jesuit Social Research Center. The Jesuits are the kindest people on the planet, they say. And I'm being told that all the time. They have so many soup kitchens, you have no idea. They're not interested in politics at all. If you really want to believe that, then you are, are ignoring history. And you are forced to repeat it. Now let me tell you what Zechariah has to say on the issue. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners, Zechariah 9 verse 12 of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up the sons of Zion. Against whom? Against thy sons, O Greece. And made thee as a sword of mighty man. God has pleaded with Greece. Is he talking about literal Greece here or is he talking about the philosophy? He's talking about the philosophy. And God's people are the antidote to Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy is the enemy of God. It's the enemy of God. It is the exact opposite way of thinking to the Bible. Verse 15, the Lord of hosts shall defend them and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones and they shall drink and make noise as though with wine and they shall be filled with bowls in as corners of the altar. And the Lord will save his flock. He'll save his flock. But the enemy is Greece. Let's make sure 1 Corinthians 1, 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Worldly wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Foolishness. So our way of thinking is what to the Greeks? And the Jesuits just said that their whole philosophy is based on what? Greek philosophy. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God can change the thinking of the Greek mentality. He can bring it in and change that way of thinking so that it comes into harmony with the Word of God and the Bible. Let's read on. Promoting religious freedom. I talk to my own people and some of the leaders tell me that the Roman Catholic Church just wants religious freedom. Liberty, religious liberty. And I try to explain to them the way they define religious liberty is exactly the opposite as you define religious liberty. It's not good enough to listen to the same terminology and assume that they mean the same thing. They don't. They use the buzzwords religious liberty, religious liberty over and over and you're thinking your way and you think what wonderful news this is. It's a nightmare. Let's define it and see why. So we bishops in the United States have adopted the communication slogan, free to serve. You must be free. You must have religious liberty. We hope that by showing people what our religious freedom permits us to do. What does it permit us to do? To serve the common good. Our religious liberties will be respected. You only have religious liberty if it serves the common good. Otherwise, you don't have religious liberty. If you want to be an individual and you want to do what God says and it doesn't fit into their definition of common good, you have no religious liberty. None. Oh, but Rome has changed. No, she never changes. Religious liberty 
ought never to be collapsed into freedom of worship because our relationship with God extends beyond worship. I'd like you to explain that sentence to me. Good luck, as Trey Gowry would say, trying to explain that sentence. What does that mean? It means you don't have any religious liberty. Fox News, Joseph Sousa, why religious liberty is the most pressing issue facing our world today. So here is the news media, which is controlled by whom? <laughs> Just by the way. Propagating this idea that the most important issue is religious liberty. It will solve everything. Just think about the turmoil of Islam and Christianity blowing each other to smithereens. If we could only have liberty to worship as we want to, wouldn't that solve the problem without me wanting to address them or them wanting to address me or whoever wanting to address whoever? Let's all work side by side within the framework of the common good. What does that mean? What does it mean? Let's read what the Spirit of Prophecy has to say. Protestants have patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism. The people need to resist the advances of this dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Spirit of Prophecy says it is the most dangerous foe to religious liberty. And our people are looking at it and saying, but they, they talk about religious liberty. No, they don't. They have a definition which you don't have. It is a dangerous foe of religious liberty. And I prefer to believe this source over their sources. You shall be hated for all men's sake, for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 10, 22. And then in Maranatha. There is no necessity for thinking that we cannot endure persecution. We shall have to go through terrible times. The persecutions, now listen carefully. Of Protestants by Romanism, by which the religion of Jesus Christ was almost annihilated, will be, what? More than rivaled when Protestantism and Popery are combined. We are heading for serious times. We are heading for serious times. Trump hosts victims of religious persecution at the White House. These things are made prominent in the news media. He met with dozens of victims of religious persecution at the White House on Wednesday as part of an ongoing effort by the administration to push for religious freedom abroad. 27 people, including Christians from Burma, Vietnam, North Korea, Iran, Turkey, Cuba, etc., 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 Pakistan. What kind of countries are these? Afghanistan, Sudan, Pakistan, Muslims, New Zealand, Jewish persecution, victims from Yemen and Germany and what? All the whole world is involved. We have to get them together. We are going to stop this religious turmoil. The world cannot take it anymore. And who's pushing for it? The second beast. So the United States of America is going to raise up structures to ensure that religious liberty exists throughout the world. That nobody, nobody will ever attack another one ever again. As long as it serves the common good. What if the common good entails that you may never speak publicly to someone of another religion of your faith in Jesus Christ than to try and convert him to that faith? What if that becomes a crime? Or what if other issues become paramount and for the common good they decide to bring in legal legislation which requires everyone to worship in a particular way on a particular day for the common good. Would you then have a problem? Can you see a problem arising on the horizon? Okay. Now, 
while we're doing this, we might as well go the whole way. Catholic sports, this is from Crooks, talking about the Catholic pulse. It's a very good source. Catholic sports is not just about wins, but it's for the common good. So sport is for the common good. Okay, what does that mean? Practically speaking, this approach led to the development of religious cultures in medieval Europe in which games and sport were engaged in on feast days and Sundays. And their incorporation in the schools of the humanists and early Jesuits during the Renaissance. All right, so this mode of thinking today is carried forward in the world by whom? Tell me the school system or the university system that is not involved in sports. Because they're all on the Jesuit model of learning against learning. So sports is an integral part. What day is the great sports day or the great sport days? Saturdays and Sundays. This heritage influenced Catholic schools in the United States, which incorporated time and space for young people to play games and sport from the start in the mid-19th century. The theological underpinning for the acceptance of play and sport had to do with the understanding of the material world as good. Just run that by me again. In order to do these things like sport, you have to understand that we are really what? Good. This world is good. And what does the Bible say about this world? It's wicked. The love of this world is what? Enmity towards God. So you can see it's a totally different mindset. You're on another planet here. And this sport becomes part of the common good. If you look at all the great sports teams, well, most of them are owned by Knights of Malta. They're all Catholic owned. And if you look at the World Cup and all of those issues, well, they are founded on Roman Catholic principles. It was Jules Rimmet, the Frenchman, who gave his name to the statuette that Bobby Moore rather shyly held aloft as he was carried in his teammates' shoulders in Wembley sunshine all those years ago. So this is the World Cup. It is a Roman Catholic invention. As a devout Catholic, the rerum novarum issue... In other words, equalizing the playing field, taking from the rich and giving to the poor, making everyone on the same level. And for that, you have to create the chaos. You have to create so much hatred against the rich. Exactly the same situation that you had in the French Revolution, right? And the Spirit of Prophecy says that what happened in the French Revolution will be repeated on a global scale. So here we have it. And how do you keep these masses happy? You give them sport. He already said he's not going to distribute them so that you are well off after this distribution. It's just there's nobody that's rich anymore to get angry with. But the little that you have, will you please pay it when you go to the sports stadium to go berserk so that you can empty your pocket once more to make these people even more rich while you are now not alone living in poverty, but those that were rich are also now in poverty and can't even employ you because they don't have any money anymore. So we're all level on the playing field. This is communist social justice thinking. It has been developed in the think tanks of Jesuit mythical thinking. Spirit of prophecy. There is such a thing as leaning heavily on men and lightly on God. Those in charge of our schools should put into active service every talent possessed by the students that can be used for the help of the school. When this is done, as it should be, it will be found that students will not hanker for football, tennis, and other amusements. What the students need to be taught is how to make themselves as useful as possible wherever they may be placed. They should learn how to adapt themselves to the work in hand. Christ said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. In the night season, I was witness to the performance that was carried on at the school grounds, talking about one of our schools. The students who engaged in the grotesque mimicry that was seen acted out the mind of the enemy. 
some were in a very unbecoming manner. A view of the things was presented before me in which the students were playing games of tennis and cricket. Then I was given instruction regarding the character of these amusements. They were presented to me as a species of idolatry. Like idols of the nations, there were more than visible spectators on the ground. Satan and his angels were there making impressions on human minds. Angels of God who ministered to those who shall be heirs of salvation were also present, not to approve, but to disapprove. They were shamed that such an exhibition should be given by the professed children of God. The forces of the enemy gave the decided victory, and God was dishonored. He who gave his life to refine, ennoble, and sanctify human beings was grieved at the performance. Cricket? Baseball? Is this real? Some of the most popular amusements such as football and boxing have become schools of brutality. In this month alone, two boxers have died as a result of this brutality. They are developing the same characteristics that did the games of the ancient Romans. The love of domination, the pride, the mere brute force, the reckless disregard of life are exerting upon the youth a power to demoralize that is appalling. Other athletic games, though not as brutalizing, are scarcely less objectionable because of the excess to which they are carried. They stimulate the love of pleasure and excitement, thus fostering a distaste for useful labor, a disposition to shun practical duties and responsibilities. They tend to destroy a relish for life's sober realities and its tranquil enjoyments. Thus the door is open to dissipation and lawlessness with their terrible results. Whatever is done under the sanctified stimulus of Christian obligation, because you are stewards in trust of talents to use to be blessing to yourselves and others, give your substantial satisfaction for all that is done to the glory of God. I cannot find an instance in the life of Christ where he devoted time to play and amusement. Show it to us. Is it anywhere in the, in the Bible? Now, I want you to put yourself now in the shoes of those that really believe this. You'll be very popular in the world, won't you? Will you? No. You're a stick in the mud. That's what you are. And they will hate you. They will hate you. For this reason alone. Because this whole mindset is based on Greek and Roman philosophy. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Participation in social life. Authority. Would you like to know the source? Vatican.va. The official source of the Vatican. Every human community needs an authority to govern it. Oh, how, we, how stupid were we to ask for a king? We got one. The foundation of such authority lies in human nature. <laughs> this is fascinating stuff. Common good presupposes respect for the person as such in the name of the common good. You may only respect the person in the name of the common good. In particular, the common good resides in the conditions for the exercise of the natural freedoms indispensable for the development of human vocation such as the right to act according to a sound norm of conscience and to safeguard privacy and rightful freedom also in the matters of religion. Let me read that again. Freedoms indispensable for the development of the human vocation, such as the right to act according to the sound norm of conscience. Who defines the sound norm of conscience? Not God. Greek philosophy and Roman power, but it should be made accessible to each what is needed to lead a truly human life. There we have it again. It appears over and over again, to lead a truly human life. The common good requires peace. You get it? 
Do we have peace at the moment? No. Are you being driven almost insane by the chaos? So what do we need? Common good. That'll solve it. That is the stability and security of a just order. It presupposes that authority should ensure by morally acceptable means the security of society and its members. A common good which permits it to be recognized as such, it is in the political community that its most complete realization is found. It is the role of the state to defend, promote the common good of civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies. And there must be a what kind of common good? A universal common good. This is global. Every nation, tribe, people, how many will worship the beast? All will worship the beast. Is the turmoil only in the United States and America? Is the turmoil only in South Africa? Is it only in Europe? Is it only in France? Is it only in Germany? Is it only in Ukraine? Is it only in China? Is it only in Japan? Is it only in Korea? Where is it? Is it only in Afghanistan? Is it only in Pakistan? Is it only... I can go on and on. Isn't it everywhere chaotic? So don't we need a global common good to end this senseless nonsense? So it is necessary that all participate, each according to his position and role in promoting the common good. All of us. As with any ethical obligation, the participation of all in realizing the common goods calls for a continually renewed conversion of the social partners. Everybody. Nobody is going to get past this one. Nobody. The political community and the public authority are based on human nature. Thank you for defining that for me. What is good is, is based on human nature. Who said that in Genesis? Who decides what is good for you? You will be able to say what is good and what is evil. It resides in human nature, not in God. This is dragon religion. And they worship the dragon. That's what the Bible says. They worship the beast by obeying him. And by obeying the beast, they are obeying the whom? The dragon. They're worshipping Satan. The Vatican is an organization that worships Satan. I know it sounds harsh, but the reality is that that is what the Bible is saying. The diversity of political regimes is legitimate, provided they contribute to the good of the community. Everything, even the state, must be subject to the common good. Now let's ask this gentleman from the Jesuits what he thinks about these things. While he writes in Introducing Theologies of Religion, for Jesus, the spirit-filled prophet, excuse me, Mr. Jesuit, you call yourself the Society of Jesus, and you write for Jesus, the spirit-filled prophet, the focus of his life and relationships was the reign of God. That meant that he was not, as his followers have often been, church-centered. Did you know that? He was not church-centered. On this rock I will build my social society. He was not church-centered. His primary concern was not to increase membership of his own movement or community. Rather, it was to transform people's hearts so as to from transform their society. This tells you exactly how they think. It is the most horrendous quote from the pen of a Jesuit. Social justice stands above God. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And please note that in that statement is that you will not proselytize. You will not. You will not try and convince someone that they're in the wrong religion and they need to come out of her, my people. You won't do it. It's hidden right in there. 
primary concern was not to increase membership. That means you will not try to tell anyone that they should accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That is, that's the crux of the problem. Christian dualism has so exaggerated the difference between God and the world that it cannot, cannot really show how the two form a unity. <laughs> I thought love of the world was enmity with God. Now he's saying God is love of the world. True, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but for a reason that whosoever should believe in him should not perish and have, but have eternal life. Totally written out of the Constitution. Ye adulterous, this is what I thought, ye adulterous and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. These people are the enemies of God. They've just defined themselves as such. And Paul Netter goes on to explain to us what the common good is. Can a person be saved that is to come to live a truly human life? Well, if that's the definition of salvation, to live a truly human life, where everybody is on the same level, and the only enjoyment you can have is to watch one ball being kicked into a net, and you have to pay for it, then really they can keep it. Because I am looking for a better world than this, really. It's pathetic. I must be very careful with my words. Is that the definition of to be saved? No. To live a truly human life? No. no, it's not the definition to be saved. It's an evil definition. Now, let's see what the common good must entail for our time in which we live. Laudato si, you all know it, we all know it. Praise be to you, my Lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us. What is that? What is that? That is... Ah, uh, it gets worse. International negotiations cannot make significant progress due to the positions taken by countries which place their national interests above the global common good. Here we go. This is Laudato Si. This is not some strange document. Now let's read this one. Sacramental signs on the celebration of rest. Article 233 in this encyclical. The universe unfolds in God, who fills it completely. Hence there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dew drop, and in a poor person's face. What is that? That's pantheism. Let's call it panentheism. This is panentheism. Out of the pen of the Pope. We spoke about it this week. This is panentheism, and it is satanic. The ideal is not to pass from the exterior to the interior to discover the action of God in the soul, but also discover God in all things, in case you didn't get it. We serve a personal God. We do not serve this God who defines what the common good is based on the language of Lucifer and not the language of God. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has a special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. Excuse me? It also proclaims man eternal rest in God. So he wants Sunday to be part 
of this common good. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. He doesn't care two hoots about the poor because he just said they're going to remain poor. There's just going to be a redistribution of wealth, not to make them wealthy, but to make them that take the wealth wealthy, and then to keep you happy, make you pay to go and watch football. Mary, the mother who cared for Jesus, now cares for maternal affection and pain for this wounded world. Carried up into heaven, she is the mother and queen of all creation. This is so, let me not say it. No Christian should ever, ever embrace this without incurring the wrath of God. We've all just made fools of ourselves again. Maybe it's time to declare a national Sabbath, said the New York Times. Maybe it's time to step back from the skull mongering and assess who we are right now. It's a bit of prophecy. <sighs> I can breathe again. <laughs> All Christendom will be divided into two classes. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. As the Sabbath has become a special point of controversy throughout Christendom and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them the object of universal execration. That's a very strong word. You cannot get stronger than that. Add to that your position on sport, and think how the masses will love you. This is not a popularity contest. We're up against the wall. There is no uglier word than sin. This is me writing. And all created beings have suffered because of it, but the God of the universe has suffered the most. The basis of sin lies in pride, discontent, selfishness, and covetousness. It leads to lies and murder. The man of sin has multiplied sin under a cloak of righteousness. He has driven through his economic systems that he controls the man of sin to this great divide between rich and poor so that he can saw them all off and get his common good and get what the worship that he wants universally. That's what he's done. And the hatred that he brings up and conjures up in humanity, where they become brute beasts and want to execute anyone who doesn't think like them. You are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. From within, out of the hearts of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Pope Francis encourages teen climate activist Greta Thunberg to continue her fight. Well, if you want to succeed, enroll the youth. Why not? So she comes to the youth. There she is with the poet. Pope Francis met teenage climate activist Greta Thunberg following his weekly audience at the Vatican. The Swedish 16-year-old held a sign that read, Join the climate strike. Tell students to stop learning. You did not act in time. Greta Thunberg's full speech to the MPs, the Guardian. The speech by 15-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg, everyone should listen to. Should we? <laughs> should we? Well, let's have a look a little further. What's that? What's that? Hmm? What does that mean? What is that the symbol of and who is it the symbol of? Of the New Age Antichrist? 
Is that the symbol? Why would she pose like that unless she's been asked to pose like that? She's being used as a little dupe. At least when young people start standing up and talking to God, it's under the unction of God and not someone manipulating them into thinking that way. Greta Thunberg to sail the Atlantic for climate conference. We'll be sailing across the Atlantic Ocean from the UK to New York in mid-August. Why? Because we don't want to have carbon emission. So we'll be sailing. Well, she better watch out for that spray while she's sailing. She could get wet behind the ears. <laughs> it's just a possibility, isn't it? And this carbon thing. Do you know that there are two scientific criteria out there? The one that is being peddled by the West and the one that is uh, maintained by the Russians and the others. And the, the one says that carbon has increased dramatically over the last decades. And the other one says if it has increased, then at a maximum of 0.1%. Which one do you want to believe? And why do some of the top climate experts say that only the Russian one is the one that is accurate? You can go and check it out. I'm not going to give a lecture on climate. But really, if you're worried about carbon, the ocean is the biggest carbon sink in, on the planet. And if you don't believe that the ocean can absorb carbon, then look at the Carboniferous. We have the White Cliffs of Dover and all of that that was absorbed into the ocean. The ocean will sink any excess carbon rise. And if you still don't want to believe it, then why, why are we so ignorant? Why don't we follow the, the Ethiopians? They at least had the brains to, follow, to plant more than a million trees in a day. What are they going to do? Put a carbon monitor on your mouth to determine how much tax you must pay every day? Well, you might as well put a plastic bag over your mouth and die. Because the carbon dioxide that you breathe out is the food that the plant needs to give you the oxygen that you require. God has designed it like that. And these people, in my opinion, are lying to you. It's probably a hate crime to say that. I don't know. Maybe they've gone that far. You're not allowed to deny climate change. This is amazing. Parliament of World Religions, Hanley Foundation, the Ten Commandments of Laudato Si. This is the Parliament of World Religions talking about the Ten Commandments of the Papal Encyclical and how they must be enforced. And these are the speakers. Oh, Cambridge Scholars, 2007, the Ten Green Commandments of Laudato Si. Father so-and-so. It's either Catholics or it's this professor who is a Jewish rabbi or this one who comes from the Islamic world or whatever. If Pope Francis is right when he insists that the solution to our environmental problems cannot be found only in technocratic approaches by governments and institutions, but by a wide and thoughtful embrace by all of our common responsibility, then Father So-and-So's book is precisely what we need at this time. Thank you, I've read enough of their books. I've got a better one, it's called the Bible. And there are the Ten Commandments. Spiritual perspective is now part of the discussion on the environment. That's an interesting one to start off with, isn't it? The poor are disproportionately affected by climate change. If you can explain that one to me, I'll be very happy. How are the poor disproportionately affected by climate change? Aren't we all in the same boat? Well, then the Pope must be worst affected because he's the richest man on the planet. Less is more. <laughs> Their philosophy never ceases to amaze me. Catholic social teaching now includes teaching on the environment. Discussions about ecology can be grounded in the Bible and church tradition. I'm glad they think so. Everything is connected, including the economy. Scientific research on the environment is to be praised and used. Widespread indifference and selfishness worsen environmental problems. Global dialogue and solidarity are needed. The change of heart is required. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now, this is fascinating. This is Pope Francis. God is young. 
And this is what he writes. Climate change is increasingly alarming. In your opinion, they're asking the Pope, do young people recognize the urgency of the matter? Are young people today more likely to protect the ecosystem than previous generations? This is a subject that is very close to my heart, says the Pope. Because only by protecting the ecosystem can we protect our children, our grandchildren, and every future generation. Consequently, caring for the environment, listen carefully, should be written in red ink and highlighted on the first page of every political agenda. Should be written in red ink. What is written in red ink in your Bible? So who's telling them what to do? Every political agenda? The Pope. He's saying that. And whereas my Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, tribe, and kingdom. Not climate change. It doesn't tell that. It doesn't say that at all. So at the last G20, who was present? Well, they had all the great keynote speakers. Look at the... The, the bishops, the archbishops, and the, the world leaders that were speaking there. And besides the keynote speakers, representatives from, I'm, I have to say this, all the major religions, ecumenical bodies, and the sporting world were associated at this meeting. So at the last G20, all the religious bodies, all of them, all of them, and the sporting bodies. Are we getting a plan together here? The G20 Interfaith Forum is a platform for raising the level and effectiveness of religious inputs and providing a sharp focus on values on global political issues, bringing together global leaders and experts from religion, civil society, governments, academia, and of course, all of these issues that they want to talk about aging societies and care for the earth, etc. Parliament of World Religions gives us a summary of what happened. The messages from Pope Francis and His Holiness Bartholomew commit to working for peace and collaboration with faith actors, focus sharply and explicitly on the needs of children. Sounds all very good. Bolster actions to strengthen the rule of law and initiate and commit to global and national message to combat trafficking, and climate change is very high on the agenda. Here's another interesting one. CBN News. This is, look at the date, 2019. Government restrictions on religion increasing worldwide. Oh, where? Government restrictions on religions have increased markedly in many places around the world. Not only in authoritarian countries, but also in many European democracies. They're going to tighten the screws. The time is coming. Hegelian dialectics, moving humanity towards the ultimate goal. Todd starts, I had a front seat row at Trump's State of the Union. You won't believe what I saw. Going back now to his inauguration. A few days ago, I caused a bit of an uproar when I said on Fox News that there was an evil in the Democratic Party. After what I saw on Tuesday night, I absolutely stand by these words. There is something demonic happening within the ranks of the Democrats. Perhaps they should consider swapping their white dresses and cloaks for sackcloth and ashes. The new America, the same is happening in Europe, where right-wing parties have gained significantly. Not surprisingly, both the CFR evaluations of the races, etc., and the European Union's dictatorial rule as being expired by far right. They're moving towards the right. And the power that the parliament has really is to change laws. They want to change laws. What laws do they want to change? The European Commission is the initiator of laws, and then parliament can debate and change them. So these European parliamentary elections were very closely watched. The highest turnout ever. Okay, let me first go to this one. To give you a little bit of background, if you think Donald Trump is the flash in the pan, and it was never planned like this, and he's really turning the apple cart upside down, then perhaps you should think again. 
because there has never been a president that hasn't been the president before he was the president. Let me put it that way. Right now, Christians are professing that prophecy is in the making, as an Israeli organization has started to mint coinage, which displays a 70-year fulfillment of Israel. It represents the gathering of Israel together again, giving all glory to Trump's image which is in front of King Cyrus on the front of the coin, and a rebuilt third temple on the back. The coin itself, paired with the current geopolitical state of affairs is shocking as it indeed represents that we are on the verge of a cataclysmic period in time, known as the end times. However, one specific aspect of this coin caught my attention, that is, the image of Donald Trump on the front, paired with the symbol of peace, a dove, on the back. It reminded me that before Donald Trump was elected president, he was referred to as Donald the Dove. Why is that? Well, back in 1983, a well-known photographer named William Coupon had photographed him with a dove when he was at the pinnacle of his career. But what did Donald Trump have to do with a dove that would warrant this picture? While it's difficult to find, William Coupon is on record at least twice, stating that the photo shoot was for a Manhattan Inc. magazine edition. He states on time.com, quote, I shot Donald Trump twice. This is my favorite. Trump was offering his services as a peace negotiator between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Later on Tao Style, he writes, He, Donald Trump, was 32 years old when I took that photograph in 1983. He was attempting to, independently, negotiate an agreement between the Israelis and Palestinians at that time. So when the news first broke in the Trump presidency, that he would try to attempt Middle East peace, it took many by surprise. Many thought that this was Trump being flamboyant, that he would, even recklessly, display how he is the chief negotiator by trying to tackle Middle East peace. However, many do not realize that this has been on Trump's mind for a very, very long time. Over 35 years, to be exact. While many think that Trump happened to grab the presidency by happenstance, just due to a cascade of events in the geopolitical sphere, many peculiar things tell us otherwise. For one, there has been some predictive programming of a Trump presidency via cartoons, as with the Simpsons episode in 2000 called Bart to the Future, or this eerily accurate heavy metal cartoon called The Wall by Peter Cooper from July 1990 which even foretells of a Trump wall. But even more disturbing is Trump's direct integration with the White House back in the early 1980s, which relates back to the photo of the dove I showed before. The photo was used in this Manhattan Inc. magazine edition entitled Donald Trump's Ultimate Deal. In this magazine, Donald tells us how he can solve nuclear arms proliferation across the world What's shocking about this article, as I mentioned prior, is that Trump states that he has been in close talks with the White House ever since the early 80s, as well as his plan with which he would disarm the world. In referencing to his intertwining with the White House, he states, I'm dealing at a very high level on this, he said, with people in Washington, in the White House. There was too much at stake for him to risk the wrong kind of exposure on the subject. The subject being nuclear proliferation. In summary, he states, referring to the rest of the world outside US and Russia, most of those pre-nuclear countries are in one form or another dominated by the US and Soviet Union. Between those two nations, you have the power to dominate any of those other countries. So we should use our power of economic retaliation and they use their powers of retaliation. And between the two of us, we will prevent the problem from happening. So Trump's solution is a partnership with Russia to subdue other countries from obtaining nuclear arms. Other than teaming up with Russia, what were his specific plans? 
Well, he states, again, referring to the other countries, maybe we should offer them something. I'm saying you start off nicely as possible. You apply as much pressure as necessary until you achieve the goal. You start off telling them, let's get rid of it. If that doesn't work, you start cutting off aid, and more aid, and then more. You do whatever is necessary so these people will have riots in the street, so they can't get water, so they can't get band-aids, so they can't get food, because that's the only thing that's going to do it, the people, the riots. Trump is so bold in this interview that he even declares sanctions against allies like France, since they have the nuclear bomb. He states, they've got the bomb, but they don't have it now with the delivery capability they will have in five years. If they don't give it up, and I don't mean reduce it, and I don't mean stop, because stopping doesn't mean anything, I mean get it out. If they didn't, I would bring sanctions against that country that would be so strong, so unbelievable." End quote. So these are the thoughts of Donald Trump 35 years ago, that he was already entwined in the White House, that he was already attempting Middle East peace, and that, at least in reference to nuclear disarmament, he is prepared to work with Russia to subdue the rest of the world into riots by massive sanctions and other means. Well, isn't it interesting then that 35 years ago from these statements, Donald Trump is pursuing Middle East peace, that he is being investigated for a variety of collusions with Russians, and also publicly states that the two should moderate the Israeli-Palestinian peace, that just as he was prepared to bring massive sanctions on France 35 years ago, that he states today he will sanction European allies if they continue to deal with Iran in the nuclear Iran deal. So it seems to me that one, Trump and perhaps the elites have been grooming Trump for this event for nearly four decades. And two, his thoughts of the past seem to be reflective of what he is actively doing right now. Here's another interview. I don't think I'm going to play it because it's a bit long. It's just interesting to me that uh, Oprah Winfrey asks him about his status and whether he will ever run for president. He says, no, he doesn't think so. But if he does, he's going to win. And he's a juvenile there. And uh, what does he say? Exactly what the other one says. He says it out of his mouth. He will force the countries and he will bring such sanctions on other countries and bring the economies in line and do all of those things that he's doing. This is an agenda that's been coming a long, long time. They have finally come to the point where their plan is going global. That's where we are. And when it goes global, because the beast, did he go to the Vatican? What was he dressed like? In black. What was his wife dressed like? And all those with him, what were they dressed in? Black. This is a game. And if they think they can dupe us into believing that it's not a game, then I'm surprised. Secret of Bilderberg meeting draws Pompeii and Kushner. Well, if he's such an outsider, what are they doing with the Bilderbergers? Trump, if no Israel-Palestinian deal during my presidency, it'll never happen. What if he brings about this peace? What, he brings, what if he brings about the uniform economic social order? What if he brings about religious peace and forces all the people to accept this global common good? And then the nationalism goes and everything is set in place. U.S. North Korea, Trump and Kim agreed to restart talks in historic meeting. He's doing all of these things which previous presidents found unbelievable. His maximum pressure strategy stokes fear of war. And at the same time, the Pope, trolling prompt, donates $500,000 to help migrants try to reach the U.S., they look like enemies, don't they? They are not. They are playing a game with your mind. That is what they are doing. Jesuit chief, 
No country has the right to turn away migrants. This is the boss speaking. The superior general of the Jesuits declared this week that no country has the right to turn away migrants. Will you look at the date, please? 24th of August, 2019. The White House is tearing down the wall between church and state. We've been waiting for this for years. We don't even have to read it. The very meaning of the phrase religious liberty and religious freedom traditionally understood as referring to the right of Americans to practice whatever faith they wish or no faith at all is being altered to mean that government should foster a closer relationship with those who want to mix their Christian faith with taxpayers' dollars. Religion-related issues, especially if buried in lengthy government documents, can often seem obscure. Yes, they're the masters at writing obscurely that you don't understand what they are saying. While it is impossible to overstate the long-term importance of the next court appointments, Mr. Sessions and many of his fellow cabinet members offer textbook examples of the everyday perils of entangling religion and politics. So they're arguing against it, but they've lost the cause already. It was left to secular organization to identify all religion rationalization as the fundamental problem. And uh, the separation of church and state means that we don't base public policy on the Bible or any religious book. Here's an interesting one. Jeff Session announces a religious liberty task force to combat dangerous secularism. So they have organizations in place to make sure that you adhere to the common good? We have gotten to the point, he said, where courts have held that morality cannot be a basis for law, where ministers are fearful to affirm, as they understand it, holy writ from the pulpit, and where one group can actively target religious group by labeling them hate group on the basis of their sincerely held religious beliefs. You may have your religious beliefs. We're going to see to it, provided they comply to the Common good? What if the common good says you must go to church on Sunday? What then? Religious liberty definitions have been expanding over the years. Jesuit to remain as house chaplain in the new Congress. So this is the house chaplain of the Democrats. He's a Jesuit. And what is he? He's a liberal Jesuit. The Jesuit who former Speaker of the House, Representative Paul Ryan, sought to oust. He's a liberal. What does he stand for? He's pro-LGBT. His other Jesuit friends are anti. And yet they swear a common oath. Does that make any sense? How can one propagate one issue and the other one propagate against it? This is Hegelian dialectic. This is exactly what it is. They are making fools of society. Rise of the religious left. DNC hires faith outreach director to address the party's God problem. You see, they've now been so anti-God that something has to be done. God has to be incorporated. Otherwise, they're going to be history. So it doesn't really matter who's going to win. It doesn't matter whether the Democrats win or whether the Republicans win, that's not the issue. Common good is the issue. Rise of the religious left. DNC hires faith outreach, just another source to show that it's not a flash in the pan. And then Fox News says, the whole rebellion against King George was based on the immutable laws of God. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Where are we going? Do you remember the video clip in yesterday's video? in the fall of Babylon part one? What did Angus Buchan say? We are going to implement what? The Ten Commandments. That's a global issue. Here you have the same issue. It was based on the what? The immutable law of God. Which law? The biblical one or the papal one? That's what we have to ask ourselves. So the Democrats are surrounded by the Jesuits. And who is this man surrounded by? What is this man? What is that man? What is that man? And what are these crosses they are wearing around their necks? Well, this one's wearing that one. And this one is wearing that one. This one is a Marian one. Well, let's make this one a little bit clearer. It's an exact copy of what the Pope wears. 
Now, why would he wear it? Why would he wear this cross? With a man standing like this, who happens to be a Cyrus. Well, let's have a look at the Scottish Rite Journal, 33 degree Scottish Rite Journal. An X is an ancient symbol for change or transformation. Long associated in medieval and Renaissance art with the coming of the Messiah who shall make all things new. Which Messiah are they waiting for? They're not waiting for mine. And the Bible tells us that he will appear as an angel of light and he will impersonate Jesus Christ. We are on the edge of stupendous movements. And this Pope has chosen this cross to show that now is the time. And the people standing behind Donald Trump are wearing that same cross. And the opposite Hegelian Jesuit is standing with the Democrats. It doesn't matter which one wins. This is just a game. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The observance of the false Sabbath will be urged upon, to, upon us. The contest will be, be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs, which include sport and other things, will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatening, imprisonment, and death. Can you see it on the horizon, yes or no? At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. When? At that time. This is now. We are already seeing a shaking in our midst. Some are aligning themselves more and more and more with the beast, seeking favor, climbing into ecumenical councils, even within our own ranks. And others are saying, no, we stand by the principles of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's going to come to a clash and it's going to be ugly. Even from within, it's going to be ugly. At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. Many a star that will have been admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will then appear in the shame of their own nakedness. Trial and persecution will come to all who in obedience to the word of God refuse to worship the false Sabbath. It's not only an issue of the day. It's an issue of authority. Who is the authority in your life? Is it God and the Bible? Or is it the Pope and his tradition? Force is the last resort of every false religion. At first it tries attraction as the king of Babylon. Brainwashing. Mind control. Tried the power of music and outward show. If these attractions invented by men inspired by Satan failed to make men worship the image, the hungry flames of the furnace were ready to consume them. I was fascinated when Theresa May, while she was still pres uh, um, Prime Minister of England, said that human rights do not apply to those who are religiously intolerant. Excuse me, that means you can just get rid of them. You don't have the right to life then. The papacy has exercised her power to compel men to obey her, and she will continue to do so. We need the same spirit that was manifested by God's servant in the conflict with paganism. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. My appeal to the world out there is come out of Babylon and come and stand with God's people on the word and on his truth and on his commandments and not on those of the world. And then experience the power of God. It's not enough, for nothing at least, that we've heard testimonies like we've heard today to make us understand what is coming. And God will preserve his people as verily as they preserved that man who was talking here on this stage today. May God give us that wisdom. May God give us that courage. May God give us that fortitude. And may God make us faithful servants of his truth.
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.